Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Attorney General Tom Horn sues to stop an investigation into his alleged campaign violations. An appeals court rules that dreamers can have driver's licenses in Arizona. And an Interior Department decision paves the way for a casino to be built near Glendale. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight's show was scheduled to be a debate between Republican candidates running for Attorney General, but that debate has been postponed at the request of Attorney General Tom Horn. And so the debate between Horn and challenger Mark Burnovich has been rescheduled for Monday, July 28th and will air at our normal broadcast times of 5.30 and 10 p.m. Speaking of Tom Horn, the Attorney General has filed suit to stop an investigation by the Citizens Clean Elections Commission. That investigation is looking into claims that Horn broke campaign laws. Joining us now is Tom Collins, Executive Director of the Citizens Clean Elections Commission. Good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And we should mention again that we are working with you uh, to put on these, these statewide debates for state offices and such. So I want to make sure that's clear and that's, that's out there. That's right. Yes. So thank All you. right. Uh, Attorney General filed suit to stop this investigation. Your initial thoughts? Well, I think that, you know, we, we've looked at this uh, matter. The commission had, a, had a, a vote in front of it about two weeks ago now about whether or not to initiate an inquiry. And that was based on a recommendation that I made. And the commission has a rule that says before it, you know, sort of goes forward with, before I go forward with anything in terms of an investigation with a candidate who's not part of the public financing system, that I should go to them and ask them for authorization. That's what we did. So it was a procedural vote, vote by the commission. And uh, now the attorney general has brought a suit to stop that inquiry from going forward. And the suit claims that clean elections, the commission, does not have authority over non-clean election candidates. That, that is the, the upshot of, of Mr. Horn's uh, uh, complaint and the complaint that his attorneys have filed. Uh, that's an issue that, you know, the commission has uh, clearly uh, uh, stated its position on, and the statute itself is plain. When the voters passed clean elections, they wanted a, a clean election system that, involved, that included independent campaign enforcement by the, by the Clean Elections Commission. The statute's very plain, and if it wasn't plain enough, the Arizona Supreme Court in a 2004 case said that the duty to do enforcement is a paramount duty that does not relate to public financing. And so, you know, the commission uh, is simply following the statute, and the, and the Supreme Court has confirmed what that statute's plain language is. The lawsuit also claims that this is not a campaign finance issue and thus clean elections should not be allowed. Uh, does not have authority, I should say, uh, over the situation. Your thoughts? Well, again, I think that this is a uh, preliminary, we're at a preliminary stage where we're outlining the nature of, uh, we've outlined the nature of what the allegations of the complaint are, and, we've, and I've outlined the response. Mr. Horns had an opportunity to respond to the commission, and the commission voted to go forward. He'll have an opportunity to make uh, any number of legal arguments procedurally throughout the process. There's judicial and administrative review. Um, the fact of the matter is that the Clean Elections Act sets forth the law that's applicable to candidates whether they take public financing or not and that law involves reporting and it involves limits it involves those kinds of things that 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 are involved in the allegations and that's and that's the substance of a recommendation you mentioned reporting and limits again the suit claims that that what you're investigating uh, these claims especially by the former worker Sarah Beatty uh, nothing to do with clean elections the Commission itself nothing to do with what the Commission has authority to look at at. Again, your response. Well, I think that the, the, the I just disagree. I mean, it, uh, and, and, I, and I can say I disagree because I've written this recommendation. The commission has unanimously endorsed going forward with the inquiry. I guess what I would just say to folks, though, is that uh, the facts are not out yet. We have an inquiry going. We are moving forward in a, in a manner that will ensure that we get the facts in a manner that and allow the commission to make a deliberate decision which is subject to its own um, set of judicial and administrative appeals. So uh, I guess the answer to that question is, I don't know what the facts are yet because we haven't established them. We have a recommendation I've written based on the response Mr. Horn uh, provided to the complaint. Uh, and under, those, under that set of facts, there is certainly uh, sufficient evidence and uh, sufficient uh, legal basis. Uh, the, the, the legal basis is clear that there's a Clean Elections Act issue there. The question of how it resolves itself 
is still before us. And what about now this new law that only the Secretary of State and the Attorney General can investigate those who are running with private funds? Where does that new law come into play here? Well, that's a, that new uh, law um, was, is, a, is an important thing that there's been a lot of misinformation about. Um, and what I will tell you about it is this, is that the legislature amended that bill in order to pass it in the first place. They had to amend it to narrow it to exclude Article 2 of Chapter 6 of Title 16. Now, that's a very complicated sounding sentence, but it's actually a simple concept. That's the Clean Elections Act. In other words, in order for this bill to pass, it had to exclude the Clean Elections Act and therefore make it you know, relatively ineffective. I don't know what the sponsor thinks he was doing. What I can tell you is that the plain language of the bill and the clear language of the Clean Elections Act, when you put them together, there is simply no impact on the Commission's authority to move forward with this inquiry. So even though the new, and it's not supposed to be retroactive here, and I think it goes into effect to what, July 24th or something along these All lines. All bills do. You're saying that this does not affect what you are doing or should not affect what you are doing? That's correct. I mean, what we, what we are saying is that the, you know, the commissioners have, have sworn a duty to uphold the Constitution, and they've sworn a duty to, to enforce the act. The act was not affected in, in, in any substantial, at all, by the, by the, by the bill. And that's because the bill distinguishes between Article 1 of Chapter 6 and Article 2. And again, I hate to go back to that, something that sounds so technical, but it is incredibly important that these words mean what they say. And, and just as a legal matter, titles are made of chapters, which themselves are made of articles. So if you say, don't do Article 1 to a group that is enforcing Article 2, it's not meaningful. And that's what, the, that's what our position is, and I think that's clear. So you're saying there's cherry picking going on there. The bill, in order to get it through the legislature, they amended it to narrow it. And then when it passed, some members, some sponsors of this bill came forward and said, oh, we really did restrict the Clean Elections Commission. Well, you can't do both. You can't both amend a bill like they did to narrow it, mm -hmm. and then when it passes, say, aha, it did what we were saying the whole time. Um, has Clean Elections ever uh, removed a privately funded elected official from office? No. Has Clean Elections ever uh, fined a privately funded elected official in office? In office, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that. I can say that the commission has, has fined um, uh, uh, non-participating candidates. Um, uh, the, the most famous example was Matt Salmon back in 2002, which a lot of folks may still remember. Um, there was a fine levied in that case. I can't recall the exact resolution, but there was a vote to, to fine him as far back as then. So this has been something that the, the commission has been doing since its inception. So it's simply false to say that the commission has never enforced against a non-participating candidate. So what's next in all this? Well, the commission will move forward. I'll, we'll move forward with our inquiry in, in, a, in an effective manner that is not going to be, uh, that you know, and at the same time, this lawsuit's been filed. There's a scheduling conference on Friday, and then there will be a briefing schedule. It, probably this won't be fully briefed before the first week of August as, as things work out generally. That's my prediction. But in the meantime, the commission is taking the steps, or this, me and my staff are taking the steps necessary to ensure that we get the facts um, in, that are necessary to develop a recommendation if there is one to be made at this point. All right. Uh, good to have you here. Thank, Thank you for joining us. We Thank appreciate you, it. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled today that young illegal immigrants given deferred deportation status can have driver's licenses in Arizona. Governor Jan Brewer had issued an executive order denying those licenses, but the court ruled that the young undocumented immigrants were harmed by what the court said was Arizona's unequal treatment of those granted federal work permits. Supporters of the court's decision reacted at a press conference this afternoon. The court was very strong in stating uh, that the harm that has been caused to these folks is irreparable. It's continuing. As we all know, this is not a state where you can do without a car, uh, where you can drive, take your family to a me a medical care, take care of your family without a car, as we, uh, again, all know. Uh, this will lead to that finally uh, reversing that vindictive, illegal, ugly decision uh, by the state of Arizona. Today uh, is a day of triumph. For all of us here, it's a day of triumph for Arizona Dreamers all across the state. It's the day that we can finally exhale and 
re in relief from an in inhale that was taken two years ago when Governor Brewer banned driver's license to all deferred action recipients. She banned us from the ability to drive, she banned us from the ability to be able to further expand our careers, and she banned us from having our identities. To me, it was a very personal attack because to many people, a driver's license uh, is something that they take for granted. But as we have learned, for us, it's a lot more than that. A driver's license would allow us to get from one place to another to finally be able to get to those jobs that Deferred Action was able to grant us. It would be a way for us to visit our family members, to finally take a road trip without fear, and it would be a way to represent ourselves and our identity. So to me, when Governor Brewer made that announcement on August 15 of 2012, it was very personal. It hurt me very deeply. The governor's office reacted to the court's ruling by calling President Obama's deferred deportation program lawless and said that the ruling is especially disturbing because of the recent influx of young illegal immigrants. The governor said the state will continue to fight for the rule of law. Here now to discuss today's ruling is Lori Roberts of the Arizona Republic. You've been following this story, a whole bunch of stories, but this one as well. Yep. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, your initial thoughts on the nights, it wasn't much of a surprise, was it? Not a surprise at all. You could sort of tell during the uh, arguments that were done few months ago, the tone of the arguments of the three-judge panel that this was the way they were headed. It's very difficult to say that we're going to treat one group of deferred action immigrants one way and another group another. And that's essentially what the court found was that it, was, it, that it violated the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution. And talk about that, that differentiation there because I think some people are a little bit confused why these folks were treated differently than other folks with the federal work permits. Well, I think they were treated differently because the governor was in a snit about the fact that <laughs> that President Obama created this Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals DACA program. Mm -hmm. She calls it lawless and says that Congress is the only group that can enact laws to defer deportation status of groups. But there are a variety of um, classifications of immigrants who are here who apparently have this deep deferred status. Some of them are victims of crimes in other countries, some of them may be fleeing domestic violence situations, and those people have routinely been able to get driver's licenses in Arizona. And so the courts are essentially saying, why is this group different from that group? Now the governor would say this group is different from that group because this group got that deferred status as a result of laws passed by Congress, whereas the DACA, the DACA kids got got the um, deferred status because of a direct a lawless directive of President Obama. And DACA's Dream Act, uh, Dream Act uh, uh, acronym there. Um, didn't the state do something last year though to expand the ban on the driver's well, licenses? Well, they, they did. When um, after she she enacted the ban, people came forward and pointed out, well, there are other groups who have these employment authorization documents who are able to get the licenses. So her response was not to say, oh, well, then I guess it's okay. Her response was to say, well, no, no longer shall those people get them either. Yeah. Um, but that really didn't wash with the courts. They found that it was a case of, of basically spite. I believe the word they used was animus. Animus. But yeah, I was going to ask you about that. It's interesting to see the court basically say that, uh, first of all, the unequal treatment, they, they emphasize that, but that the governor's actions showed animus to these Pretty kids. Strong language. It, it seems like it is. Now the governor will point out that all three of the, the judges on this, this panel were um, appointed by Democratic presidents, but it is interesting that one of the three has the distinction of having been appointed both by Barack Obama to this court and Alaska Governor Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Palin for the Alaska Supreme Court. Interesting. So, and Interesting. she was one of the three. ACLU also called it vindictive policy by the governor, and the governor's response again was that this was outrageous and, and these sorts of things. Why is she taking such a hard stance on this? Well, I think she fashions herself the finger wagon governor who's going to tell this president what to do, and it plays to the base, and it's an election year. You add up um, the Central American children who are here, and now this, and a couple other things going on, and you know, immigration, immigration is firing up the base again. I'm starting to hear from all the people I heard from in 2010, and the rhetoric is, is revving up, and it's, 
I guess it's good for Republican politics. I was going to ask you about that because, again, her response, a lot of it was political in nature, mentioning that the three judges were appointed by Democratic presidents, uh, mentioning the Obama policy as being lawless, and all these sorts of things. There was a lot of name uh, name dropping and name calling in there, which seemed a little, again, uh, pretty harsh for a governor's statement. I don't think it's harsh for this governor. She's been harsh all along on President Obama's um, uh, Deportation, treatment yeah. of, of, of illegal immigrants and her, her perceived lack of any kind of border enforcement and the like. So I think it, it's right in line with what she's done. And, and the interesting thing is, is that what nobody's talking about is, let's just take care of this problem. Most people in this country would say that, that this particular group of Im immigrants who are here illegally, the childhood arrivals, are the most sympathetic group of all, and that ultimately we are going to have to incorporate them into this, the only country that they've ever known, why don't we just get on with it and fix the problem? But do most people in Arizona feel that way? I have seen polls that say that they do. We are only one of two states that I know of that deny driver's licenses to this group. At least 45 do. Only our state and the state of Nebraska do not. And now, of course, as of today, we, we grant them as well. How far is the state willing to go on this? Is it going to be uh, fighting this tooth and nail, you oh, think? Absolutely. Um, you know, they have to, for one thing. They've, they've put the money and the time into, into it at this point. But remember, this is just a preliminary injunction. Mm -hmm. You've got to go back and fight the merits of the case at the, at the federal court level, at the district court level. So this will be going on for a while. It would be far easier if we just took care of the problem and solved it. Well, some of these, it's supposed to be a two-year uh, deferment here. Some of these kids are going to be past the deferment before this thing is even yeah, figured out. Yeah, but it's renewable. Okay. Those, those things are renewable. I'm sure that, yeah, they are. It was started in, it started in August of 2012. 12, yeah. So the first group of renewals are coming up now. We have about 20,000 students. Uh, they're not really students. Yeah. 20,000 ch uh, young Arizonans that this applies to. Okay, so basically we watch what happens as far as the state is concerned uh, going after this particular ruling, and uh, it will never end, will it? No, it won't, because it's good politics. All right. Laura, it's always a pleasure. The U.S. Department of Interior ruled last week that the Tohono O'odham Tribe can claim that land the tribe owns near Glendale is part of the tribe's reservation. Here to tell us what the ruling means regarding plans to build a tribal casino on the land is Heidi McNeil Stoudenmire, a partner in the law firm of Snell and Wilmer and an expert on Indian and gaming law. Good to see you again. Thank you. We always ask you in when something happens and it, always, it just seems to happen with some regularity and it always seemed to side with the tribe. And again, what did the Department of Interior exactly decide? Well, the department had issued a ruling um, several years ago which said that the tribe had the legal right to take this particular land, the 54 acres in Glendale, into trust. That decision was then uh, the subject of a lawsuit in Arizona federal court. The Arizona federal court judge said, you're right, you can take it into trust. It was then appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Ninth Circuit also generally agreed with that, but they said, you know what, we don't think the Secretary of Interior addressed an issue of whether or not the land at issue lies within the corporate limits. And that's what's important here, the language of corporate limits of Glendale. And so they said, okay, Secretary of Interior, I want you to look at this again and look at it specifically in the context of does this land lie within the corporate limits of Glendale? And that was the sole issue that the Secretary was to look at. So they basically were looking for clarification. Yes. 
So the corporate, what does that mean, the corporate? I think everyone can kind of figure out a county island is not, is not involved in a city. Is it, what's, what's going on here? Well, um, the arguments that were made by the opponents is that this land is, it is a county island. There are three sides of it that are under the jurisdiction of Glendale. And they said, well, you know what? That really was not intended by this act to let this little island escape escape and therefore the tribe should not be permitted to take this county island into trust. And so the secretary said, well, we have to figure out what does within the corporate limits mean and went through a very, this ruling is 19 pages. Mm. It's very detailed in terms of the analysis, um, looking at policy issues and legal issues and case law. And at the end of the day, the Secretary of Interior, actually it was the assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, Kevin Washburn, who determined that what they needed to look at was had the city of Glendale actually annexed this land into the city. And the Secretary of Interior, the Assistant Secretary said, no, didn't annex the land, end of story. So 19 pages of clarification there for the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth, I would imagine the Ninth Circuit now has enough clarification. What exactly will they be deciding on? Um, well, this was now ruled on by the Secretary of Interior. Um, whether it goes back to the Ninth Circuit again to look at, or whether or not the city of Glendale now may have to start another lawsuit over again on this issue. I guess procedurally, I'm not quite sure, other than I know that it will probably be continued to be litigated by somebody, someone, whether it's the city of Glendale or the other tribes um, that are opposing this. So basically, again, everyone's looking at the compacts regarding Indian gaming and everyone's looking at the legality of opening that casino in the Metro Phoenix area. Again, those seem to be overriding principles here. Um, where do they stand with this Department of Interior decision? I mean, does anything change along those lines? Well, I think in terms of the casino, again, and we've talked about this in the past, there's a lot of different uh, challenges that the tribe, the Tohono O'odham tribe has faced in uh, trying to get a casino off the ground. This is just one more uh, step that they've taken forward. This decision though is very careful to say that we are not making a decision on gaming. Basically the decision says you have the right tribe to take the land into trust and what that means is that the tribe will now have jurisdiction over the land, they can exercise all rights over it as if it is now reservation land, but it doesn't um, necessarily mean from that opinion that the, the Secretary of Interior has made a decision that they can conduct gaming on it. Interesting. So at Salt River President, uh, Salt River Tribe President said that this decision could lead to the tribe, Tona Odom, any tribe, I guess, um, acquiring other county islands and building casinos on those county islands. Is that valid? Well, I, I understand the arguments um, being made, but the, the thing that you have to keep in mind here is that the underlying background for giving the tribe um, their legal rights for taking the land into trust is the Gila Bend Act. Um, there are very strict conditions and requirements for what the tribe needed to do in order to qualify for being able to take land into trust. Those, the Gila Bend Act is only applicable to the Tona Odom tribe. Um, this is very fact specific. So in terms of it, the slippery slope argument of mm -hmm. whether this is going to lead to other tribes or other instances of tribes taking land into trust in the middle of Los Angeles or New York City, I understand those arguments, but I think they're going to be extremely difficult legal challenges for that to ever occur. What about in parts of the Phoenix area, as opposed to New York and Los Angeles and these sorts of places? Um, in terms of other tribes or in terms of the Tohono Odom tribe? tribe? Well, again, the Gila River or the Gila Bend Act was very specific in terms of what the requirements and conditions were. There's only a certain, they were limited to how many parcels mm -hmm. that they could take into trust. They were limited by how much land they could take into trust. And they were limited by the counties. Um, so I, I think that with those sort of restrictions in mind, it's very, it would be very difficult for this same situation to occur 
again. Last question. We've heard uh, critics of this, this whole thing saying if the Honolulu tribe are allowed to do this, it blows up the gaming compact and, and, and all sorts of mayhem will result. Is that valid? There is a separate lawsuit that's pending on that compact issue of whether or not the tribe is allowed to game um, under the compact because if they want to have class three gaming, they have to have a compact. Um, but that lawsuit is now at the Ninth Circuit and it is being fully briefed and I think there probably will be oral argument held later this year. So there may be a decision on that next year. So I, I think that one is in the courts and who knows how that's going to end up. All right. Well, it's always good to have you here to explain what is a very complicated and never ending, it seems, situation. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.